Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Garrity. I'm a plant science product manager here at Decagon Devices. Uh, today I'm joined by Dr. Colin Campbell. Uh, he's vice president of R&D here. Uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing today is leaf water potential, uh, how to measure it using one of our instruments. Uh, Dr. Campbell, this is, this is a, uh, a method that you developed during your graduate studies. You actually have a lot of it published here in an article in the Agronomy Journal published in 1999. Um, why don't you, you start off by telling us why water potential is important to measure? Well, I've always wanted to measure leaf water potential and one of the reasons is, is that we can really understand the stress state of a plant if we can measure its water potential. And so right when I started my graduate studies, one of the things what we wanted to know is can we measure leaf water potential in situ? And I really turned to the literature at that point to say what is available out there that would help us measure leaf water potential. In the night we can tell really the recovery of a plant, um, uh, it, it really get an idea of, of the water availability in the soil. During the day we can get an idea of the stress level of that plant if we measure leaf water potential. Now before we go any further, one of the things I thought at that point was you know we can measure this uh, in all plants and really understand the stress level of all plants and it's really not true. Uh, Dad tells a story um, about when he was measuring water potential in potatoes and he thought, he thought you know this is a really good measure of, of how stressed plants are. In one year they had some volunteer potatoes in one field that wasn't being irrigated but they were still growing and in a fully irrigated field right next to it and what they, he said, okay, this is the moment that I'm going to prove to the world that, you know, I measure leaf water potential and we can measure the stress. So he went and measured the water potential of the, uh, these potatoes and the, the volunteer potatoes that had just come up from old potatoes left in the field from the year before and compared them to the irrigated potatoes and the leaf water potentials were exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, well, well, yeah, it, it was like, oh no, this theory doesn't work. Well, it turns out that water potential and measuring water potential in leaves is probably the most important in perennial plants. So in annual plants, they usually control their stomatal conductance during stress. And that's what this, these potatoes did is that they controlled their stomates. They made very small leaves. It's not as if they were making giant potatoes with no water. That would be a great thing, but it didn't happen. Uh, what they were doing is little tiny leaves uh, controlling their stomatal conductance and that's how they maintained uh, the stress. So, uh, that, so, so the principle of, of leaf water potential and how, you know, how, it, uh, how we can measure and understand a stress state, we have to be a little careful and not say, well, this is a giant brush, let's paint it with you know, everything with that. In perennial plants, that's where we're going to be able to use that. So that, that really is the first principle. Now, when we talk about leaf water potential, uh, go to the blackboard here, or the whiteboard, and we can just draw the anatomy of a leaf. So here's a leaf. Um, maybe we have a little stomate here. Um, uh, that's the outer surface of the leaf. If we looked at this leaf at very in very fine detail, what we'd find on the surface of that leaf is a waxy cuticle. And below this, of course, we got the palisade parenchyma cells right here. Draw some of those. And then we have the mesophyll cells just down here. And uh, once we get tired of drawing little cell circles, we'll move on. Um, usually, we could measure uh, the inside of this leaf, the, the water potential, or, or what we might talk about is the relative humidity inside a leaf. If uh, Nobody thinks of it that way, but those are equivalent by the Kelvin equation. Uh, and I've talked about that at other times um, in, in some other lectures. But the, the point is, what we want to do is take some sensor here uh, in some way and be able to fill the headspace here with water that comes out of the leaf. So that's the goal. Okay, this is the headspace, and if we stuck a little sensor here, we can measure the water potential. So what I did here, we had a little thermocouple psychrometer, um, and we clipped it onto the leaf, and we didn't measure leaf water potential. Uh, and the reason is, not surprisingly, that immediately following our clipping some dark chamber on the leaf, instead of having this beautiful open stomate, immediately we had 
just this closed domain. Water was not making out of the leaf, and, and basically we didn't, we couldn't measure leaf water potential. And this was just because it was dark. You've cut off light, so it's going to shut its domain. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it, it's dark. Now the question is, can we eventually equilibrate? Well, we can. Uh, the time it takes is about 10 hours. Wow. And then we're, you know, whatever is going on probably has ten, changed. Ten hours for a single measurement on a single leaf. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and I put in a graph into that original paper showing that after ten hours we can do this. So, you know, like any, any budding young master student, I said, you know, what we need to do is we need to allow vapor to flow across this leaf more easily. So if we remove that, that cuticle surface and we just expose all these palisade parenchyma cells here, we have fast dedication, er, desiccation right out through these cells. So we look for, uh, for ways to remove the cuticle. There are a lot of ways that people have tried. Um, chloroform, uh, N-butanol, uh, carborundum powder, which is a gritty surface that you can rub on there. Um, lots, of ver lots of things uh, that they tried. Well, it turns out that not very many of these are any good because once you put, for example, N-butanol on a leaf, it dies. And chloroform kills a leaf too. It does take off the waxy cuticle, but there are a lot of other problems. So, so one of the things we thought is what if, so looking, looking in, the, in the literature, so I'm going to erase our chamber here. Um, and looking around in the literature, back in the, in the mid-80s, what they had done is just take a, a piece of 600 grit sandpaper and they had rubbed the, the surface just back and forth um, on the surface and they had taken off this uh, waxy cuticle and there was some indication that this might give uh, some success there. So what we did was was we in this paper we went through and tested all these ways. Uh, we tested the, the chloroform, the ambutanol, we tested the carborundum powder, we tested the 600 grit sandpaper and then we we tried to see with this uh, a, a uh, parameter we measured the stomatal conductance to see what did we, did we significantly improve the, the conductance? And, and what we found was that, in fact, the 600 grit sandpaper was the best. And so we started, started doing that. And, and you can read in the paper essentially what happened. And I can draw you just a, a graph of this. It's kind of interesting. Um, we were doing this on a variety of, of, uh, of plants. Um, but the one that was really most interesting was corn, a nice field crop. Some of the plants we had were not as, as useful to look at. They weren't agronomic, agronomic crops. But what we essentially had was we show in, in the graph, this is time, or in the, in the paper, this is time and this is water potential, that we started at time, time zero here. This is about 10 hours here. And we started two, two measurements on this, this uh, corn plant at the same time. One was with an abraded leaf mm -hmm. and one was with an unabraded leaf. Mm -hmm. The abraded leaf uh, immediately came to some water potential that looked like that. The unabraded leaf looked something like that right. and then eventually it came to the exact same value. That gave, and this was something we could consist consistently see and gave a suggestion that, yeah, we could reach the same water potential uh, no matter what we did, but obviously this was a lot faster. And, and about this. how fast can you get once you've abraded it? So abrading the leaf, from all our measurements, it indicated that, that we could be, become within uh, one tau. So we, we actually modeled this, yeah. okay? We modeled it with a, uh, um, a first order decay model, and it said we could come in within uh, seventy percent of the final reading within about seven minutes, okay. and we can draw a line to the to the finish. But within within about ten minutes, ten to twelve minutes, we're we're close enough to the actual. A significant water improvement over ten hours. I would say so. Yeah, yeah uh, I would say so. It, and the problem here is that that there are other options, right, to measure water potential. But if we could figure out a way to measure water potential uh, quickly without us having to do a lot of work uh, to get that, that's the main value. So, so the major. The, the other major method that's available is, is the pressure bomb, right? Yep. That, that would yep. be the major competing method here. Um, 
what, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of both of these methods that we're talking about? So maybe most people are going to be familiar with the pressure bomb and how that works. Um, but how does that compare? What are the advantages of this method over, over right. the pressure bomb? So the pressure bomb, you know, we teach it in our lab every year uh, in, in environmental biophysics. We go grab the leaf, we cut the leaf off, we put it inside the chamber, and then observe when the, the water comes uh, to the end of the petiole. Right. The, the major challenge with that is that when, when does water come? I've made, uh, I've made probably eight to nine hundred of these measurements, especially during this master's study. And, you know, if it was bubbling there, or is it water, when is the end point, when I see the first kind of bubble coming up, what if it's, I'm just getting air out, out of the xylem, what does that mean? And, and so that's the major challenge. There really is, isn't an absolute clear end point. When other people are doing that, they see the end point a little differently than I do. So there's a little bit too... There's a little bit of art, a little bit of subjectivity right. in there that, that might cause some error, variability from one person to the next or from one reading to the next. Exactly. Um, the other challenge is really when you're, when you're making this measurement, I think my biggest frustration is that, is that you're needing to fill your nitrogen tank. You can't be very far from a compressed nitrogen source. And, uh, and, and if we're going to take it to the field, um, which is one of the real advantages of that technique, uh, still you, you have to bring your liquid ni or your, your compressed nitrogen along. Right. So that, that's the, the, one of the big challenges. Advantage to, to this approach is that there is one number. You put it in, the instrument decides when it's done, and you don't decide do we have air bubbles or do we have, have xylem water sure. coming out? Um, and, and the speed of the measurement, you know, you can, you can do a lot of samples. You can do them back in the lab when you're not sitting there right next to the plant trying to, to get stuff done, um, you know, and run these samples. And, and I assume that while the, while the machine, the instrument is trying to figure out what the number is, that frees you up to be doing something else. Sure. Preparing, be preparing the next sample or whatever it might be. You're not sitting there watching, waiting for that drop of water right. to appear. No, that's really true that you don't spend a lot of time just making sure that it's, it's coming out. Okay. Now, I mean, I've used both methods a lot. I find value in, in both methods. Um, so it's not as if, you know, there isn't a place for, for, for one and the other. And we'll, we'll maybe get into that. Uh, there's opportunities to, to we're going to talk a little later about a virtual seminar uh, done by, by a, a young technician in our lab. And so if people want to go and look at that, they can see some of the work that we've done with the, the pressure chamber and the, the uh, chilled mirror approach. Okay. Um, You're gonna show us how this yeah, works. Let, let's let's talk about uh, you know what we do when we we abrade a leaf. Um, one of the one of the challenges to to either of these methods that we're talking about with with water potential is that that we have to know our leaf a little bit um, because it, we've got to run this a, a few times. I've done again, hundreds and hundreds of, of leaf abrasions. If you haven't ever done it before, you're gonna have to do these a few times before you wanna go and start publishing these data. You wanna get comfortable with them. Uh, so let me show it to you. When I started doing these things, the thing I wanted to know is what's really happening at the level. I drew a leaf up here. I wanted to know what's happening at the leaf level. And we went and, and took some, some pictures with the environmental scanning electron microscope. So we could actually put a braided leaf tissue into the, into the microscope um, and we could look at, at, at the damage we did under abrasion. And the neat thing is that, that generally we were able to abrade the cuticular surface without really causing major, major damage to the palisade parenchyma cells right below that. And, and the reason we could is because we knew our leaves pretty well. So it wasn't as if we were taking the softest, most light leaves and, and trying there. You're going to have to, maybe you don't even need to abrade a surface where there's a very light cuticle. But a, a leaf like this, I can tell there's a cuticle because I can see it shining in the light here. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to have to take it. Leathery, yeah, you can, right. you can really feel that. You can feel it there. So let me just show you how, how this works. Um, so to remove the cuticle on the leaf, the thing that you have to realize is that you don't have to remove the whole cuticle. Um, that some of the cuticle will do. And you also don't have to use your kind of power uh, on it. You don't have to use a lot of muscle. 
Um, so we're going to take just a little bit of distilled water from a dropper. We're going to place one drop just on the leaf here. And we're going to take this, this 600 grit sandpaper. Is that just lubrication? Well, it is. Okay. Yeah, so, so the idea of the water is not is just to help me slide the sandpaper across without really having the abrasive nature of the grit itself on the, directly on the leaf. So it just allows this to move to slide a little bit better across the leaf. And I'm going to do it 10 times in one direction. Yeah, you're not applying a lot of pressure there, are you? No, so, so this is just a real light pressure. You can see that the sandpaper is just moving across without my finger actually doing it. I'm applying the pressure just from the bending of the paper there. The thing that I always look for when I'm done with this is to, to kind of dab this with a with a, a piece a kim wipe and just to look, do we have green material there? That'll tell me if I've lysed a lot of the cells. And right now that's there's no greenness that I can see. Now as long as we've got the Q tip out, the next thing that we want to do is actually dry the water. But before we go nuts and dry the water, we got to make sure that we're ready to put it in the cup. Because cuticles are amazing things. They keep plants from desiccating. Uh, but if you take that off, they will desiccate and you're going to ruin your measurement. So this is still, you can see that, that the, there's still a little wetness on the surface. I'm going to wet this, or dry this, sorry, with the Q-tip. And then I'm going to immediately go to the next step, which is taking a leaf cutter cutting out a leaf disc and then I'm going to put it directly into my cup. Now about that quickly. You don't want to leave your leaf sitting out and just drying for any amount of time because that's certainly going to change your, your water potential readings. So it also might not have been obvious but this tool that you've, you've made uh, for cutting the disc it appears that the disc is, is the exact diameter to fit into that sample right. cup. Is that right? Yeah. Is yeah. that important to have that matched up? So, one of the, you ask a great question there, Steve. The, the, um, the thing that, that we, now we can go in here and look at this. We're not going to put it in the instrument sure. just yet because we want to see some things about it. But, but the thing that really is critical is not necessarily that it touches all the edge of the sample cup, but that the cut edge area versus total surface area is, uh, is very low. So that we only have just a little bit of cut edge versus a very large surface area on, on the leaf. So that's a critical piece. Does it have to be this exact size? No. Uh, now Decagon doesn't supply these, but, but everywhere I go, people making these measurements, they've got one of these. So, so go to the hardware store, find a little, little conduit and sharpen it up. Uh, that, that way you can have this really nice uh, cutter. Now the thing that I want you to see on here, this is a little harder to see, but before I showed you the waxy surface of the leaf, now if you look here, there is some, some uh, gray yep. on this leaf surface, and you ask, well, what is that? That's where we've removed the cuticle from the top of the leaf, and now we have, uh, we have a, a drying surface. Uh, it wasn't white when we put it in there, but now we've been in this dry environment uh, for, for a minute, minute and a half as we've talked, and those palisade parenchyma cells have dried out. Now again, the question was, you know, did we, when we kind of dabbed that leaf dry, did we lyse any of those cells? And our Kim Wipe is, is still white. I don't think we, we did that. Now, but even, just to be clear, even if you would have, when you when you dab it with the chem wipe, you're, you're sucking up some of that, that sap that's being released from the cell, right? And so it's not going to negatively affect your, your measurement if you do happen to lyse a few cells. That's, that's, that's exactly right. I'm glad you brought that up. Is that some of the, so we talked about the water being a lubricant, yeah. but it also is it essentially dilutes the cell sap. If we, if we do lyse some cells, some cells and when we dab that with the Kim wipe, we were actually removing the rest of, of that water and we're able to make that measurement. Um, and, and so people often ask, hey, wait a second, are you kind of skewing your measurements either by lysing the cells or by, by uh, putting distilled water on it? And that's the purpose of the Kim wipe, is, is to do that. Now, <laughs> I, we don't own stock in Johnson & Johnson or whoever makes, makes Kim wipes. Um, 
But the point of the Kim wipe is, is that there is no uh, fragrance in there. There's no oils. There are often oils in just regular Kleenex or something like that. And the Kim wipe is just pa a paper product. Uh, and so it can be used to clean here without actually adding any, any other possible organics into, into our measurement. Um, one thing I want to mention, you know, what does it look like when we actually do this badly? So, so you know, we've, I've tried to show you a little bit what, what's a good uh, technique. Let's look at a bad technique. So I'm going to take this, I'm putting my finger behind this, and I'm, I'm rubbing. I'm, I'm going, going crazy trying to remove that cuticle. Um, let's just look at it when we check our uh, Kim wipe here. Uh, if you can see that. I mean, a lot turn, more green in there. Yeah. We've, we've licensed cells there. Uh, we're going to go look at that this leaf, and one of the things we'll see as we as we dry that, this is a pretty hardy leaf, and so we did actually do some good there. But we'll see some brown, some some dark green spots show up, and the dark green says you've broken cells, you've crushed the leaf, uh, you've used a little too much uh, effort on there. And that's, that's a critical piece. Now, at the edges, we've actually done some good. But in general, right in the middle, we've really chopped the leaf up. The other thing that you'll notice here is that right on the, on the mid vein, we've really taken the mid vein out. And just be aware when you're doing this. You noticed on this leaf here, I didn't do much on the mid vein. In fact, this was a little buried in this particular leaf. But most of my abrasion was out on the leaf. Just be careful in the mid-vein. Uh, it's not hard to, to cut the cells, uh, the, the xylem there, and just stay away. And as we go through this discussion, you notice this is getting wider and wider as it's desiccated. Um, and now we really wouldn't throw this in the cup and make a measurement. One of the other things that people ask me is, hey, uh, is one leaf good, disc good enough? And I would say, there really is not a problem with putting multiple discs in. I mean, it, as long as the cut area versus surface area is still very low, if you put multiple discs, don't put this disc in here, but we'll, we'll just, for, for uh, demonstration's sake, we'll cut this out. If we put a second disc in there, fits nicely, it's going to go into the instrument. That just adds volume for the equilibrium and probably will speed the equilibrium process. The thing that we haven't mentioned now is how to make the measurement, and that, <laughs> that's the fun part of it. There really isn't much to that. We simply drop the cup in here, close the instrument, and we start it reading. And it's going to sit there and, and read. It, it'll take, like we already said, it's going to take several minutes, so we don't have time to really uh, let that run um, in this video, but, but, it, but we will get a, a reading after a while, except we really damage that, that leaf, uh, that one leaf. So one of the things I'm going to ask back to you, you've done leaf sampling out in the field before, right? Um, so how have you sampled leaves and brought them back in the lab? Mm. Uh, so the, the typical way we do it is round up as many technicians, undergrads, grad students as possible. Um, and, and usually these were pre-con measurements, so out in the field with a pressure bomb. And we're running around collecting samples and bringing them back to home base. All right. Right. And, and then we have the one person with the with the uh, pressure chamber who, who's taking the readings. Uh, so usually it's a, it's a fairly big production, a big to do out in mm -hmm. the field. And and so I brought a bag along here, and now our our, our uh, piece of paper towel is dried somewhat. But the, when we've done this, we've gone out with a wet paper towel, okay. something like this. Here's a, a Ziploc bag. This is pretty beat up, and, it, and it's probably going to pass moisture fairly easily. But the idea of Ziploc bag, I think, is important. Something I would encourage you to use a sample bag like a Mylar bag. Um, wrap the leaf up. And once it's sampled inside the wet paper towel, uh, and then just slide into the bag. Nothing, nothing really crazy about this, except you're going to want to keep this cool. You know, one question there would be what how long can you leave it in the bag uh, before it's right. going so, to affect the measurement? Right. So, so that's, that's a big question. And, and most of my sampling was fairly quick. You know, we'd sample in the field. We'd go back within an hour or two, and we'd have our... Obviously, if we're running it in the WP4, it's going to take a little while. Right. So we're going to run our samples through. We keep those in a, in a ice chest or something like that. 
Uh, so so they're, they're in quite lo low temperature, and we never saw a problem with, with, with uh, issues with, for example, water potential changing from the first leaf uh, you know, to the last leaf we did. But really, this is something you're going to have to, I mean, this is sometimes plant specific. And, and I don't think anything that we can do here today is going to say, okay, there's, you know, it, it's, it's really simple. Because making leaf water potential measurements is not simple. Sure. Uh, that's that's going to be a challenge. Uh, what are the things, you know, maybe do we need to talk about here? Um, if you're going to put these samples, uh, these uh, plant samples into the, to the cups, once you put a lid on, if you're going to leave it for a while, you're probably going to want to uh, put a little piece of tape around it just to make sure uh, that, that it stays on there. Uh, you also, once you're done, you can just set them on top of the instrument. that just makes sure they're at the, the temperature of the instrument. Could I also take a, a wetted piece of paper towel or Kim wipe and put it in there just to keep things uh, you know, well hydrated? You certainly could. Um, you know, it, it, it's the same way in the back, right? So there's uh, theoretically there wouldn't be any difference. Just don't, the big thing would be um, whenever you're doing this, and it, it, you want to make sure that you don't leave drops of water around. and and. And it goes the same for when we, we use this distilled water on the leaf. Some people will get all excited about finishing up and they'll forget to dab it dry with a Kim wipe. Uh, if you do that, then you're just introducing water in there. You're not going to get a good reading. Um, and so, yeah, be careful about that. But putting a, a small piece of moistened um, paper in there may, may uh, help make sure that you're not losing uh, water vapor. I, I don't know if I'd be that concerned about them. Here's something I just noticed here. You can see now the, the heavy abrasion right here. The, we've got some, some pretty dark spots. On that uh, one that you really got after yeah. you were aggressive with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we looked, as I, I mentioned that scanning electron microscope, the, um, and we looked pretty carefully, as I said, and, and to see what, what damage was too much, we were kind of going for about a 10% uh, lice cells to just removed cuticle ratio. And with this technique where we just, we, we use 10 times again over the surface, surface of the leaf without the pressure, um, that that really got us a good, the proper ratio, or at least what we imagined to be the, the proper ratio. Again, it was least specific. I, you know, I've, I've somewhat uh, helped my own uh, seminar here by Choosing a leaf that had a thick cuticle. I didn't choose a really uh, flimsy leaf that I could just take off. So. Well, I, I was really surprised watching you do it, just how little pressure you were applying uh, to the first leaf that you abraded. Um, e even with a thicker, heavier, waxy cuticle here on this particular leaf, it really didn't take a lot right. to, to get that, that cuticle uh, abraded. And you can see that just that right here is that we, we actually got good desiccation there, but but we even showed on the Kim wipe there wasn't any noticeable chlorophyll in the Kim wipe, so we really didn't damage. I mean, we're not going to go do the scanning electron microscope right now, uh, but from just the visual, it looks it looks pretty good. Sure. One other question I have as I look at these leaf discs, you know, you just abraded a very small portion of that overall surface area. I'm wondering, is there any reason that we would want to abrade a larger? Uh, a larger fraction right. of the surface. So, so originally when I was doing this, we were using a fairly small thermocouple psychrometer chamber that was probably less than one centimeter in, in diameter. Um, and so, so abrading a swath of abrasion about like this was adequate. Now, uh, some of the work that, that people can go access and, and see uh, this, this uh, the work we did comparing the pressure chamber with the WP4C, um, I'm not sure what he did. I think he left just that strip there. But if you wanted to do a little bit more, for example, if we wanted to just put another drop of water on there and, and do this again, we'd want to first, we'd probably drop of water, do this part, then leave this water in place and do another swath. And I think that would help improve the e equilibrium time even more. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be a useful thing. Great. Well, uh, I want to thank Dr. Campbell for uh, doing a very thorough explanation of this method for us today. Um, 
as as came up during the discussion, this is this is an alternative to to the pressure bomb technique. It's not necessarily a replacement, uh, but it's something that you might find that's useful for you. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Appreciate your time. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to talk about. It. It's a fun technique. I don't think a lot of people know about it, but it's, it gives people an option uh, for making water potential measurements. You bet. All right. Thanks again.